Hi, I'm Josh Block, host of Uncover Escaping Nexium from CBC Podcasts. I pull back the curtain on the secretive self-help group that experts call a cult and follow one woman's harrowing journey to get out. The podcast was featured in Rolling Stone magazine and named one of the best podcasts of 2018 in the Atlantic. Listen to Uncover Escaping Nexium on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. This is a CBC Podcast. Hi, everyone. Phelan here. We have a special bonus episode from another show for unreserved podcast subscribers. It's an episode from the CBC podcast I host with Leah Simone Bowen, The Secret Life of Canada, where together we hold up a microscope to moments of Canadian history that have been widely overlooked. This episode is the first of a two-part episode called Ganasatake, 300 Years Later. It's been about 30 years since an event that you may know as the Oka crisis, but that's not where this story begins. Instead, we look at the 300-year lead-up to that quote-unquote crisis on Mohawk land. Have a listen. Anniversaries can be a strange thing in Canada, depending on who you are and which side you are watching from. Sometimes these anniversaries aren't celebrations. They can be marked with mourning, with a quiet remembering, or even a conscious forgetting. Sometimes some of us celebrate for that which others mourn, for what was lost. It was July 1990. I spent most of my time on the res at Six Nations outside, running around with my siblings or my cousins, climbing trees, playing Ninja Turtles or some other weird made-up game where we were like wizards and stuff. The outside world was so different from the inside world. Outside we ran, we played. Inside the TV was always on, always on the news. CBC News World had just launched, and so for the first time in Canada, there was 24-hour news. It was never-ending. Images of smoke, guns, yelling, rocks, hate, and people who looked like my family pushing up against police and the army. I didn't understand what it was, but I remember understanding something then about racism, about hate. Oka's golfers have been playing the town's little nine-hole course for more than 30 years now, coexisting uneasily with the local Mohawk band. But when the course announced plans to expand onto other land considered sacred, the Kanasataki Mohawks took to the barricades, and they've been there ever since. This is The Secret Life of Canada, a podcast about the country you know and the stories you don't. Hey, Leah. Hey, Phelan. Okay, so this episode is a two-parter, and I have to say it is a bit of a doozy. This is our first two-parter, and I feel like there have been a bunch of doozies, so I I feel well prepared. Yeah, we've covered a lot of heavy stuff. Yeah. And I have to say, I wasn't prepared to this. I, th- I thought I was, but I really, I wasn't. As a Mohawk woman, uh, this one cuts pretty close to the bone, and it kind of dug up some stuff that I was surprised to find was still there. Today, we are going to look into the history of Ganasatage. Specifically, the events that led up to what has largely been described as the Oka crisis. Right, yes, the Oka crisis. And I feel like we probably, correct me if I'm wrong, might see some shades of the Ipawash crisis that we spoke about in season one. This is very true, but this isn't going to be an Oka crisis episode. This is about what led up to the crisis. And, you know, I really hate using the word crisis when we talk about confrontations or disputes that revolve around Indigenous land. Uh, For me, it just raises the question, what constitutes a crisis? The word crisis is used when Indigenous people finally stand up for their land rights and demand their fair due. They request negotiation. And I gotta say, for us, the crisis for us on our side has been what's been going on for 500 years. Right, since contact. Yes, and although 500 years may seem like a long time ago, connection to the land runs deep. The agreements that were made, we still honor and we still hold. And so, today, for part one of this episode, I'm not going to tell you about the quote-unquote Oka crisis. I'm going to tell you about Ganasatage, how it came to be, and what led up to the so-called crisis. Because if you want to understand the Oka crisis... You have to know the story of Ganasatage. Back before Canada landed on top of Indigenous people and their lands, the people here had distinct societies, languages, and cultures. The Ganyakahaga, or Mohawk as we are commonly referred to, is one such group. How did then 
you all become known as the Mohawk. I'm assuming settlers, or is that an indigenous word? Or uh, Ding, ding, ding. Yes, yes, you are correct. Um, give the woman a prize. The name Mohawk comes from the Algonquin word Ma'aklan, which translates to bear place people. So this was bastardized by the Dutch into Mohawk. You know, the Dutch heard this word and then they kind of turned it into Mohawk. There are various hypotheses about this, because I've also read that Mohawk may mean they eat living things. But I'm Bear Clan, and as a Bear Clan person, I like Bear Place people. (laughs) So I'm going to go with that, and if you don't like that, everyone can fight me. I mean, why would I fight you? We're not, like, ranking the greatest performers of all time or something. By the way, the correct answer is Sammy Davis Jr. (laughs) So I'm on board, but, like, is Mohawk considered offensive? I think, you know, it is a matter of personal preference how you identify yourself, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So today I'm going to flip between Gunyukahaga and Mohawk. Okay, got it. So a long time before settlers came to this land, the Mohawk people had joined into a confederacy with four other nations. These nations were all neighbors, and they were the Seneca, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Mohawk. The Tuscarora Nation would join later in 1722. So this confederacy was and still is called the Haudenosaunee. We are sometimes referred to as Iroquois, but that term is like is super not preferred. Yeah, I thought that, that was a really bad archaic term. I mean, I think I read it meant murderers or something. Is that right? Its roots are in French, but it isn't entirely clear on what it means. It's most likely the French interpretation of an indigenous word. And I think centering things in the language is always a better move. So I like to use Haudenosaunee, which means people of the longhouse. Uh, It's in the language, and it's become more commonplace. Okay, Haudenosaunee. And your people would have lived in longhouses, like, back in the day, and that's where it all comes from. Yes, people of the longhouse. Okay, and so why did the Haudenosaunee, all of these people, come together? Right. Okay, so the Confederacy was formed because there was this time of war and turmoil. The Haudenosaunee nations uh, decided to band together under something called the Great Law. So the Great Law is about peace. It's about having a healthy body and mind. It's about power, uh, harmonious, nonviolent unity, and righteousness. Having a good mind that considers justice between nations. Now, this is like... A super, super, super short uh, version of this. This isn't even the Coles notes of this. This is like the Coles, Coles notes of the Grey Law. So, okay. Well, no one knows what Coles notes are anymore. She means Wikipedia, folks. The Wikipedia version. Less than that. It's like 30 seconds. Okay. But I'm going to link to some resources on our website um, if listeners want to know more because I think it is like super cool to learn about. I really love this book by Elizabeth Dockstader. It's called The Art of Peace. It's a great primer and she taught the Great Law in a really artful, beautiful way. Cool. I will put it on my list of books to buy, which gets longer every day. So the Haudenosaunee Confederacy establishes the foundations for Western democracy. So our Confederacy influenced the U.S. Constitution. Benjamin Franklin and George Washington studied the Great Law of Peace and adapted it into many principles into their Constitution. Hmm. Um, And I would love to get into all of that, but then we would be here for 6,000 years. And Mm -hmm. that's a story for another day. That's very interesting. Oh, it's so fascinating. You know, really diving into this stuff, I have a whole different understanding of things. It, It was I learned a lot, too. Each nation in the Confederacy had a role, has a role, and the Mohawks' role is they are the keepers of the Eastern Door. What does that mean, exactly? Okay, so if you look at the territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawks, they are the easternmost in the Confederacy, and their territory would have spanned from upstate New York to southern Quebec and into a bit of eastern Ontario. If a guest came into that territory from the east, the Mohawks would be the ones to greet or assess them and, you know, figure out their intentions for being in the territory. And, you know, we've spoken before about contact and how contact traveled from east to west for the most part. Right. So as keepers of the eastern door, then I'm assuming that the Mohawk would be encountering a lot of settlers at this time. Oh, yeah. So when Navigator, (laughs) I'll just say it in a saucy voice, when Navigator Jacques Cartier showed up in 1535 on his second journey across the Atlantic Ocean, he heads down the St. Lawrence River and he's just looking for the Pacific. You know, he wants to get to Asia. He wants to find gold and riches and colonize over there. And he's just, you know, out doing his thing. Right. 
The discovery of the stuff that already exists. Like, for instance, I discovered allergy medication this morning and the internet today. So first time ever, I am the person who discovered those things. That old song and dance. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so he lands in what is now Montreal, and he sees a village, a giant village surrounded by cornfields with about 50 longhouses and inhabited by thousands of people. It is also surrounded by palisades, which are these like large pointed stakes that would have fortified the village. The village is called Hoshilaga. Okay, so this is a Mohawk village. Yes. This is like a weird thing, but you know that music festival, Oshiega? Mm-hmm. Comes from this like, word, I believe. Oh. There is a bit of a dispute about this village, though, and who lived there. Some say Mohawk people. Some say it was the Wendat. Some say it was entirely another group of people that gets called the St. Lawrence Iroquois, and these people just disappear. Oh, okay. That seems convenient. I know. Okay. You so know. it makes it so much easier to claim territory if the people who live there just, you know, kind of poof. Disappeared into the night. Mm-hmm. So why do people say this? So why they say this is because Cartier returned a few years later and he didn't see the village. Oh. Uh, yeah. And no settler ever saw it again. If a tree falls in the forest and a settler doesn't see it, is it there? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Samuel de Champlain, he uh, comes in. Boo. I think we can boo both him and Cartier Why because not? Cartier was a kidnapping. <laughs> like he, uh, yeah. he stole indigenous people from the area, a chief and his sons and seven other indigenous folks. And he took them back to Europe, seven other Mohawk folks, took them back to Europe as gifts. Oh, God. Because, you know, nothing says I love you like a human. Oh, <laughs> God. I'm so depressed. I know. <laughs> and when he got sick, when he was in Mohawk territory, they cured him. So wait, what was he sick with? Scurvy. We haven't talked about scurvy in so long. I know, right? I genuinely missed it. We used to do every episode we did was <laughs> scurvy jokes. And I just, we haven't done that in a long time. No, I know. Okay, so when he got sick, um, they gave him cedar tea, which is rich in vitamin C. And, you know, he was like, oh, awesome. God saved me. Thanks, God. The Mohawks were like, well, if you want to call us God, I mean, sure, we're fine with that. But actually us. So when these explorers don't see Oshalaga, it becomes this big mystery. Some archaeologists also say that there's no evidence of it, but but I don't know. I think it was Mohawks. My opinion, again, fight me. I'm not prepared to do that, but back to disappearing Indigenous people. So you can say no one was there so that it was free land. What we do know is that many people lived, farmed, traded in this area, and not all of them were Mohawk. Algonquins and Wendats were kicking around. Montreal is an island, right? So it makes sense that it would be a meeting place. That does make sense. So let's fast forward a bit. After these explorers come through, we start to see more of a colonial presence. French, English, and Dutch are all setting up shop in this quote-unquote new world. Uh, you got the English with the trading post in Albany in upstate New York, and the French up in Montreal, which at the time would have been called Ville-Marie. There are different alliances with different nations, so some Mohawk trade with the French, and some trade with the English, and some with the Dutch. But today we're going to focus in on Montreal or as it is known in the language, Jojake. Okay, and so what was going on there? So the French are beginning to establish more of a presence in the area. And in the mid-1600s, you had a seminary of the St. Sulpice, uh, a Roman Catholic order, and they set up a mission with the purpose of converting indigenous people to Catholicism. Boo! Um, Can I boo that as well? <laughs> boo! I'm just yeah, adding sure. this. I'm just going to add boo in my own boos now. Just boo. Okay. <laughs> okay, and so what was who who ran this mission place? Right, yeah. So it's run by a group of priests called the Sulpicians, um, and they were made the seniors of the land. So does that mean lord? Is that what that means? Yes, yes, it does. So essentially the priests become feudal landlords in charge and able to make decisions about who lives where. They could give out land and they could take it away. This is when the land really starts to disappear. Uh In the 1600s, the priests set to work attempting to convert indigenous people in the area to Catholicism. In 1717, King Louis XV, who was six at the time, by the way, he orders the seminary to move. Wait, what? He was six and he was ordering people around? 
Actually, as I say that, that sounds about right, a six-year-old doing that. But someone needed a serious timeout, I think. <laughs> we all know that six-year-old. We've known that six-year-old. Well, it wasn't really him. It was some other fancy French dude. I'm guessing in a poodle wig, wearing more makeup than an Instagram influencer, acting as regent. This poodle dude would have had, he would have had the authority to make decisions for the baby king. Okay, got it. I'm picturing like a 1700s James Charles kind of guy. So being regent is like the guy in charge until baby king grows up. Yes. Still think the kid could have used a timeout, but that's just me. It's interesting because I had to look up James Charles. <laughs> <laughs> am I right? <laughs> I am. I James just... Charles is a bajillionaire. Oh, he's super rich. And he has tons of followers, much like a region. <laughs> I like how you're trying to sell this. I feel like I'm listening to your like your grade twelve like English presentation. No, 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 no. I don't think he's great. He's hilarious. He's hilarious, and he wears a lot of makeup, and he sells all his makeup. Okay, <laughs> so back to guys in poodle wigs wearing too much makeup in the 1700s. So this poodle dude across the water who speaks for the king, he says that a nine square mile piece of land near Lake of Two Woods Mountain on the north shore of Montreal should be set aside for the Mohawk people with an additional one and a half by nine mile tract added later. This land would be held by the priests in trust for the Mohawk people with the caveat if the Mohawks left, the land would return to the crown. And so in the 1720s, the church they set up the community at Lake of Two Woods. The last of the Mohawks in Montreal are persuaded to leave and relocate to this new but familiar community. It is called On the Hillside, or Ganasatage. Okay, and so how big was this piece of land? Like, how big was Ganasatage? It was about seven and a half times the size of Central Park. And I don't know if you've ever walked Central Park, but they, this is a big park, right? It's actually really big, yeah. So the Mohawk people left... Montreal with the priest to Kanasatage, but why? Why would they go? You know, their land was being encroached upon by settlers all the time. There were more and more people coming in. Mm -hmm. And the missionaries were constantly making the Mohawk people move from place to place in Montreal. So when a promise was made that if they moved, they wouldn't be bothered anymore. And, you know, they were promised that they would be granted ownership of this land, that they could stay and live. And Ganasatage was already familiar territory. Mohawk people had been hanging out on that land for a long time. It was a part of their hunting territory, fishing territory. It was familiar. And, you know, there were already Algonquin and Nipissing people just to the west of there. And some of the Mohawks, they, they didn't mind the priests. They, you know, some of them had converted to Catholicism. Right. So it sounds like it's a pretty good solution if everyone keeps up their end of the deal. Yeah. Yeah. You I know. mean, as good as it can be when <laughs> yeah. you're losing uh, all of your land. So the move happens and the occasion of moving to Ganasatage is marked by the Mohawks with the creation of a wampum belt. This is something we've talked about before on the show. It's a type of traditional contract. It's a uh, physical, visual contract that a number of indigenous nations use to sort of have agreement with each other. The belt is created to commemorate the move to Ganasatage, and this belt is called the Two Dog Wampum Belt. Okay, and what was the agreement? What did this belt look like? This belt, um, it had eight figures across it with a cross in the middle and two white dogs on either side. The dogs were to signify guards. They were to be the guards of the boundary of the land, and they were to warn when anyone was, you know, interrupting the boundaries of this territory. So... This was to be a promise that they would not have to move again and that they could just be left alone. Okay, and I have a feeling that those dogs had their work cut out for them then. I like to think that's why my white dog barks so much <laughs> when somebody tries to do laundry in my building. <sighs> encroachment, encroachment. And I'm like, no, Reg, that's the neighbors doing laundry. <laughs> doing the Lord's work. <laughs> yes, these dogs were going to have their work cut out for them. Um you know, the encroachment on the territory at Gunasatagi, it started pretty much right away. More about that in a minute. So let's recap here. 
So settlers come into the Montreal area, priests begin the work of converting indigenous people to Catholicism, a baby king over in France grants some land to the Mohawk, but he puts the church in charge of it, and that settlement is called Gonasatage. Okay, so hesitant to ask, but what happens next? The Ganyukhaga, after being moved so many times, settle into their former hunting grounds, and they plant crops in a forest, and pretty quickly the priests start to get greedy. They begin to clear the land and sell the timber for church profit, and they also start to sell land to settlers. How are they selling the land that they promised would be Mohawk land? Well, you know, it's, um, it's a tale as old as time. Um, <laughs> it shouldn't have been allowed. It shouldn't have been allowed. No, it shouldn't have been. It shouldn't have been allowed, at least according to the two-dog wampum agreement. They shouldn't have been allowed to do that, but they were feudal landlords. So they had the Poodle King on their side, and the Poodle King's law was the Poodle King's law. They could do anything they wanted. And, you know, there was a lot of distractions going on at this time, right? You know, the settlers are having wars all over the place, and survival is paramount in a lot of ways. France loses the war and has to cede its land to the Brits in 1763. Okay, so this is the Treaty of Paris, yes, after the Seven Years' War. So many wars. Oh, my gosh. So many wars. And that has to be complicated for the Mohawk. Like, there are new white folks in charge. And, like, what are they going to do? It's very weird. Yes, and complicated it was. Because what happens now is everyone is told to pledge allegiance to the British crown. The Mohawks in the area are told to pledge or your village will be destroyed. So the chiefs, they head to Six Nations. Okay, where you're from. Yes. And they meet with William Johnson, a negotiator for the Brits. He tells the Mohawks that freedom of religion and title to their lands was guaranteed under King George III. If they didn't want to be subjects of the king, then they had 18 months to sell their land. Okay, and so what are the priests doing at this time? They must be pretty nervous because there's a new, you know, poodle daddy in town. James Charles is now... Jose Charles. <laughs> or Jack Charles, actually, because he would be British. Charlie Jack. Hello, I'm Charlie Jack. I'm the new poodle daddy. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll let you to work out the parallels <laughs> <laughs> of Instagram influencers and different colonial powers. <laughs> this, this is your territory. <laughs> so, yeah, so everybody was freaking out, I'm assuming. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, they, the priests, they know that they're in trouble because the land at Gonosatage is technically Mohawk land, and the Mohawks are living there. And the Sulpicians, the priests, they are just the shitty landlords. And so they write to the seminary in France and they tell them about what's going on on the land. Tell me what a seminary is again. It's a religious school that trains priests. Okay, right. So the seminary in France transfers the land title to the seminary in Montreal. Then the superior of the order, so like the dude in charge, he swears allegiance to the British crown. So it's kind of like him swearing allegiance to the British crown's like, covers everybody's asses. Right. So then the Sulpicians had control. Yeah. The Gunyakahaga, they were pretty fed up. You know, they had made several attempts to gain back ownership of the land in 1794, in 1802, in 1818, in 1828. And by 1851, the Gunyakahaga, they are fed up. They are fed up with the priests treating them like garbage, you know, selling their land and telling the Mohawks it's not theirs. They're like, okay, so we got a, there's a new white poodle dude in charge. So let's send this poodle dude a letter. So they were still poodly then, though. It's 1851. Just for visuals, we're thinking mutton chops, very Sherlock Holmes. But like, this isn't, like, <laughs> this isn't I'm just trying to get visuals. Queer visuals. For the colonial power, Leah. <laughs> you don't have to dress everyone. <laughs> Why not? And do a makeover on <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I don't know. They were all weird. They all had big hair. They all smelled bad and they were wearing too much blush. <laughs> Okay, I mean, that's, come a, that's on. a good visual for me. I, I'm just a visual person. I need to see it in my in my mind. Okay. So they send a letter? Is that yes, what's happening yes, now? Yes, they send They're a letter. letter. Okay. And they request for an Indian agent to come and be in charge of, you know, of the territory because they're so sick of these priests. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. That's bad. That's bad. A bad, bad for the priests because to have to ask for an Indian agent to come in because you suck, that's... 
That's a new level of low. They should be humiliated. But, you know, it doesn't matter because their request is ignored and that, you know, that leads to more frustration and the priests start to, they start to put in stricter rules on the people living at Ganasatage. Oh my gosh. I imagine things would have been so tense and terrible. Yeah, I mean, you know, they keep pushing and pushing and pushing and the colonial powers, they tell the Ganyakahaga that they can leave if they're upset with the Sulpicians. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. So they've been pushed all over Montreal, then to Kanasatage, where they are told they can stay and never be bothered. And then the priests start selling off that land. And when they complain, they're told that they will give them another piece of land. Yes. Oh. In the 1850s, the British crown set up other reserves and urged people to move to them to help ease tension between the priests and the people of Gonasatage. Some do leave, but many do not. Meanwhile, the priests sell off land plots. They continue to sell off more land plots to more settlers coming into Gonasatage. Mohawks who object to this, to their lands being sold, they are ordered off the land by the church. Wow. That's so terrible and exhausting. And... Frankly, it's hard to hear. So much taking. But the thing is, no one was forgetting. Many chiefs fought to have the agreements recognized. The memory of the community, you know, it, it remained. The promises and the contracts that were made to them. The Sulpicians knew that uprisings would keep happening. Nobody was letting up, right? So, in 1860, a young Mohawk man went into the seminary in Montreal. The priests thought that they could potentially craft an ally. Joseph Onsankara was a smart kid and learned to read and write in French. And, you know, fun fact, I found this just, like, so interesting. He was actually classmates with Louis Riel. Oh, my gosh. Cool. I know, right? What a cool class. Class of 1860. Rule. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> rules. All right. Okay. Um, so when Joseph, he gets out of school, he goes to work at the seminary at uh, Ganasatage. He's the secretary. Mm -hmm. And there, he learns a lot about what the priests have been up to. He breaks ties with the priests, and at 22, he becomes a chief in the community. Oh, Joseph. Oh, this is amazing. This has more twists than Game of Thrones. I'm also hoping for a better ending. What a waste of seven years of watching that. Okay, so Joseph. Joseph. Okay. <laughs> so one of the first things that he does is he writes a letter to the governor general describing the hardships at Gunasatage. You know, he talks about how the Mohawks cannot secure their lands from the priests. Uh, they can't even cut firewood without permission. He tells them that the Mohawks are kept poor while the priests, you know, they are living large. In the 1860s, as an act of defiance, Joseph uh, cuts down a tree without asking the priests for permission. He then marched with 40 other community members to the Sulpician's residence and told them that they had eight days to get out. Oh my God, he was such a badass. I love him. <laughs> I know, he's my, he's my new historical crush. I know, mine too. I saw him Okay, first. well, we can fight about this later since apparently you want to fight all the time, <laughs> which know. is fine. Just no right. face punches or any body, no punches at all. Oh, we'll just, we'll just play like a, a game of cards. We'll play like old maid or something. How appropriate. <laughs> okay, so what happens? So what happens? Eight days to get out, then what? So, the priests are terrified, right? They get Chief Joseph arrested for threatening them. He is released, and he sends another petition to the governor general, saying, From what our fathers have told us, we always believed as they believed, that these lands were given in the first instance by the King of France to the seminary for our use and interest. Now, however, we are told that the lands belong to the seminary and that we live on them and use them only because they permit us to do so. The request was denied and the legal title to the land was given to the Sulpicians. And in 1867, Ganasatage's name is changed to Oka. It's an Algonquin word, which means goldfish. Okay, that does... <laughs> are there goldfish around there? I don't know. I think it's like a gold-colored fish, not necessarily uh, a goldfish. Ah, okay, like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I just assumed it was a French word because of the cheese. Yeah, you know, I did a bit of looking into the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird the way the holes that research will take you down. The Sulpicians gave some land to a group of monks uh, who came to Gunasatage and started making that cheese. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. So... What happened to Chief Joseph? Right. Okay. So Chief Joseph, he, you know, he longed for peace, but he, like so many, would never see it. He died suddenly at the age of 35. Oh my God, he was so young. Yeah, I know. 
As the years passed, more land was sold. More settlers moved into the area, and there were more changes to the land that threatened the Mohawk way of life. In 1911, a railway was proposed to come through the territory, which the Mohawks opposed and, and which they protested, including one, uh, one Joseph, Joseph Gabriel. It's a different Joseph. That protest ended peacefully when the workers withdrew. In 1950, Lena Nichols, uh, she was a chief's daughter. She confronted the people who were trying to build a sawmill there, and she actually read the royal proclamation to the to the workers there. In 1959, Jeffrey Gabriel, he raised funds to hire lawyers. This is 59. Indigenous people weren't allowed to have lawyers, you know, until 1951, you know, under the Indian Act. Right. Okay. Yeah. But I think the last straw really, I mean, in my mind, in 1956, the St. Lawrence Seaway comes through and that widens the river and floods lands. And that just like takes away the economy of fishing, which was so important in that area. So this is hundreds of years, like every generation, essentially. And it wasn't just done in a, or, you know, in a way that you might think of <laughs> indigenous protest. People went through the protocols, mm. sent the letters, sent the petitions. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a paper trail for all of this. I'm just thinking about generation after generation. Someone's going, yeah, my granddad protested. Then my aunt protested. Then this happened to my parents. Now it's happening to me. Oh, man, this is such an exhausting story. And And so what about the seminary and the priests? Like what happened to them? So they sold off the remaining lots of the land to the municipality of Oka, and they left in the 30s. So they sold it and got the hell out of Dodge. After all of that? Yeah, after all of that. And this sets the stage for what comes next. In the 20th century, you know, as it moves along, indigenous people across North America, they hit a tipping point. They are frustrated with all that has been taken and all that is still being taken up until today. Resistance movements start to amp up. In the U.S., you have Alcatraz in 69. You have Wounded Knee in 73. In Canada, you have the Anishinaabe Park occupation in 1974 in Kenora, Ontario. Lubicon Lake confrontation in 1988 in northern Alberta. You have the Inu and Goose Bay Air Base occupation, also in 88. So it's a, you know, we mm -hmm. see this build. And that's just a handful Oh, that is just a handful. That is just a handful. So in 1990, when the township of Oka proposed to extend a nine-hole golf course to make it a full 18-hole course and add a condo, the Mohawks said no. This course would infringe on a cemetery, a cemetery where many of their ancestors were buried, including Chief Joseph, who had opposed the railway in 1911. On March 10th, a group of Mohawks set up a peaceful protest site in opposition to the course. And a few months later, things would boil over. I don't know if you can hear any of that. Yes, it sounds like shots. Uh, they launched, uh, oh, I don't know, about uh, half a dozen or a dozen canisters of tear gas and smoke. Next time, we look into what happened during 1990, how it changed that community, and impacted indigenous resistance movements across the country. The Secret Life of Canada is recorded in Toronto on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. It was written and hosted by me, Phelan Johnson. And me, Leah Simone Bowen. Our producer is TK Matunda. Our script editor is Yvette Nolan. Research assistance by Andrea Eidinger and CBC Archives. Our digital producer is Fabiola Melendez Carletti. The senior producer of CBC Podcast is Tanya Springer. And executive producer is RF Nurani. To learn more about this episode, you can check us out at our website, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Secret Life of Canada. If there's a story or a piece of history you want to tell us about, email us at secretlifeofcanada at cbc.ca. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts because it really helps other people find us and we need other people to find us to stay here and keep telling you these hidden histories of Canada. So, so do it. Rate it five stars. Like, give us a good thing, even if you hated this episode. Yeah. 
<laughs> do that. <laughs> and if you liked our podcast, check out a new CBC podcast, Inappropriate Questions. It's fun. It's slightly uncomfortable, but it answers a bunch of questions that you might have. Yeah, that you might have and that you probably should not be asking your friends or family. So listen to the podcast and then you've you've you can you can avoid an uncomfortable dinner. That's right. You've been listening to a special bonus episode from The Secret Life of Canada. You can subscribe for free and listen to more episodes on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.